Well, the day is February 2nd, 2012. We are conducting an interview for the Arizona State University Association Video History Project. We are located today in the ASU Community Services Building. I am Bob Ellis. The technical staff today is John McIntosh. And Dave Schatzley is our director. Also in attendance is Linda Van Scoy, chair of the ASU RA Video History Project. Today I will interview Charles Raymond L. Hi, Bob. <laughs> and I should disclose that Chuck and I have been friends for over 50 years. Uh, my name is Charles Allen. I served several tours at ASU as a student, as a faculty associate that title, Bob, <laughs> faculty associate. Uh, I then went out to seek my fortune and uh, returned for a 14, 15 year run in uh, early 1980, February, February 1980, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I had several titles and the title uh, at my exit interview was uh, general manager. And I was an administrator. It didn't really make a lot of difference, but that's when they started trying to uh, change everyone to service professional. And so I went down as, as, as an administrator. I was born at St. Joseph's Hospital on North 4th Street, a few blocks north of Van Buren in 1938. Tell us about your childhood. I had one. <laughs> I was here, uh, Phoenix. Um, I think the state's population was maybe a half million. And the uh, city limits would be about an Indian school road. Those Indians, Bob, not in the city limits, <laughs> not, not at that time. So all of the uh, Indian health and schools and so forth were just across uh, the line. And uh, it, was, it was a great place to grow up. Uh, everyone knew each other. Uh, for example, uh, if my mother wanted to go shopping, uh, she would take me to my grandmother's house on 4th Street, uh, just below Roosevelt. They'd flag down the, um, the trolley and, uh, and put me on. And, and you simply stayed on until they flagged it down and said, we'll take him back. <laughs> and so you spent all day going, you know, from uh, Washington and forth up, up to Indian School. And then, and then back down. It, it was very interesting. Uh, <laughs> and then television came along, and I was really interested in television. And this was starting to bother my parents because there seemed to be no way you could make a living with it. <laughs> and Phoenix had one station, KPHO Channel 5, 1949. And it was on the air several hours every day, not too many hours. Everything was on film. So let's say a politician was killed. They'd be dying over and over in Phoenix <laughs> because they would film the newscast in New York and then the newscast would be sent to Chicago or somewhere and eventually it gets to Phoenix weeks and weeks later before the transcontinental cable. And, um, but I spent every, every minute I could at, at Channel 5 and eventually became a cable puller for uh, several dollars a day because uh, they couldn't get up to a dollar an hour. And all the hamburgers 
<laughs> yes, because they made hamburgers. Ruth Dunlap made hamburgers for the crew because it was part of the compensation package before she did her local cooking show, Cook's Corner Bob. <laughs> I was heavily influenced, uh, as was everyone else my age, by uh, the Depression and what it did to families and, uh, and, and World War II. And, and, and while World War II uh, uh, ended in, in, in the 40s, the scarcity of things went on uh, you, know, you know, past the 50s. I mean, where you had to have little uh, red tokens. Were red tokens for meat or gas? Uh, the, the A's and B's were for gas. And, and it was just, scarcity was everything. So, like people are doing today and telling me how new it is, and would I like to make a little film about it? No. We were raising chickens in order to have something to eat. And I think I was probably eight when, when my, when my great-grandmother taught me how to uh, uh, kill a chicken so that it would drop dead and not flop around and, beco and, and become hard and, and make a, a terrible dinner and you know how to gather eggs how to plant corn um my my father was from uh, columbus ohio um, and worked in a bakery and later for uh, the city of phoenix uh, my mother had started at asu and uh and couldn't afford to to finish uh, and, and of course, my father uh, went uh, went to the war, so she uh, was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, although she w she worked for the war at Luke Field for a while, and would have to find a uh, babysitter for me. Um, and one of the babysitters uh, came back to put on a birthday for me at Channel 8. Rose Moffat. Oh, Rose, right. Yes. yes. Okay. She was a young, promising secretary um, in the tax commission, and she knew speed writing. And she was from Globe, and she did it just because she, she liked my mother and my grandfather. Uh, but uh, so there were there were some uh, so a lot of time was spent in in uh, in the living room where my father had a uh, Midwest brand all band radio in which you could get radio uh, signals from all over the world. And I spent hours and hours and hours turning the dial and trying to see if you could pick up Germany or London or uh, someplace. And I'm still doing that today, only my technology is a lot better than, than it was at the time. And then my mother was a huge influence because she, she was an avid reader and we couldn't get away to go to the library very often. But she was the best customer the bookmobile had. And you know, we had little buses that drove around Phoenix with a selection of books, and you'd go into the bookmobile and find something of interest. And so there was always something to read. Uh, I think a Grolier encyclopedia was a big deal because it came with update stamps. You tear off a stamp and mail it off, and you get the updated version of some event or uh, whatever. So I think that was a big deal, and then she was hugely civic. We had, she, raised, she sold Girl Scout cookies. No, I didn't have a sister. 
Uh, she was in the first Mother's March for uh, um, uh, the war against polio, which was a huge deal here. I didn't learn to swim until I was probably 20 because it was believed that polio traveled in uh, swimming pools. And all of the swimming pools were closed in, in Phoenix for fear that the, everyone would get polio. It's the same reason they would cover their mouth when they passed this building because this was a TB sanitarium and it could get out there. Um, she was a, had a Cub Scout meeting at, at my house. And I don't think I knew it until many, many years later that it was what kept a number of people sane at, at, at the time because they, their fathers were drunks who beat them up or a variety of other things. There was a fellow whose father owned a Chinese grocery store and he had 13 brothers and sisters and I think they had one bedroom. Yeah. And so going to my house for chocolate chip cookies uh, was a huge deal. I did not know it at the time. So uh, I am actually a real native. Now you went to uh, Phoenix Union. Yes, I entered Phoenix Union High School in 56. I spent all of the time in journalism that I could. I was a very good photographer. So my faculty advisor on the annual uh, got me some freelance work with the Republic uh, shooting sports at Phoenix Union, which was the sports capital of, of Arizona. All state in everything, every year. And uh, until I was taking a terrific picture at a basketball game and just waited, you know, a second and a half too long to pull the trigger. And when I came to, having been knocked over and the crown graphic destroyed, I decided that wasn't something I wanted to do for a living. And then I became the, the editor of the yearbook for two years in a row. And they both won all state competitions. And the editor the year before, my junior year, was Nick Salerno. <laughs> and you participated in the Mask of the Yellow Moon. Yes. If I remember right. And who was your music professor? Eugene P. Lombardi. <laughs> At the time, uh, Phoenix Union High School had more PhDs on the payroll than ASU did. Sorry, ASC, Bob. Uh, and uh, Mr. Lombardi uh, was our orchestra conductor. And Harvey Zorn uh, was uh, the band conductor. And then we had a wonderful uh, organ and choir uh, leader by the name of Sue Davis, who eventually becomes Mrs. Lombardi. Right. My first station was in my bedroom. Okay. And you'll find this, this is something that people get into this business. Having built a station, you know, with an audience of one, if your headphones worked. Uh, and I, I had a, uh, a radio station in my uh, bedroom, and it caught fire, and, and that uh, we signed it off after that. <laughs> the landlord, my parents, said no to that. Uh, but yes, I had um, I was when the walking distance of a local sports station's uh, Phoenix uh, studio. And I had a dollar an hour job as the engineer uh, for a, a sportscaster by the name of Ed DeForest.
This is on KRUX, 1340. The rest of it was in Glendale. And, um, and occasionally would work with, with him on uh, baseball recreation. So start telling us about your first experience at ASU as a student. Well, I think it was when I was watching uh, football games in Goodwin Stadium, and my grandfather's pipe would uh, set fire to his jacket, <laughs> and we would have to leave early. And, uh, and then I... Um, entered ASU in uh, 1957. Uh, it was either that or the U of A. Those were the choices. Yes. And uh, people in my clique that I didn't like were going to the U of A. So I decided to go to ASU. So, so we uh, enter ASU, uh, freshman, uh, liberal arts. Uh, Dean Arnold Tilden in charge, and I was a uh, radio TV major, which operated out of the radio TV bureau in the basement of uh, a Matthews Library, yeah. and uh, and that was the beginning. And eventually, uh, General Electric paid for. Uh, a new engineering building, and it had very, very nice studios, even by today's standards, uh, for ASU's radio and uh, television's aspirations. And there was the name change was coming, a big effort to try to change uh, ASC to an ASU, and it was going to be a public vote. So there was this desire for visibility. So somebody said, what can we do? What can you do? And so I uh, invented the sewer club and broadcast from in front of the engineering center uh, out of the steam pipe tunnels and uh, gave away free cigarettes and, and free records which, of course, created a crowd. Yeah. And then I told a buddy who worked at Channel 12, and he told somebody there, and they were out filming it. And it was going to be on, uh, on NBC National. You know, one of those end of the news, yeah. those funny things people do out there. And Mrs. Gamage, the president's wife, Kay Gamage, found out about it. And, and I mean, she was just... What if this is the only thing they ever know about us? We can't let them know we live in sewers. We, we've got to stop it. And I mean, they, they all went to Channel 12 at once. And so Channel 12 got it canceled. I still have the film. <laughs> oh, yes. Every once in a while I said, that didn't really happen. And you got involved in television about 1958 when yes. your predecessors yes. over there started the station. The, the big event of 59 was ASU's Diamond Jubilee. And again, what can we do? What can we do? And, and, you know, the usual terrible ID, you know, somebody's going to make a film. Let's make a Diamond Jubilee documentary. Ooh, that's good. We'll put it in the, uh, in the time capsule, and then we'll forget where the capsule, the capsule is, is, which we did. So you never filed the capsule? No. No. <laughs> but we were there when it, when it was put in the ground, and I, I don't remember where, where it went. But, uh, so... My idea was that we have the first televised stereo television program in the state. And of course, you get the usual, oh, it's just not possible. We don't have this. We don't. Please. 
So I said, y you give me the chorus and the orchestra and, and I'll figure out how to do it. And I think we, we used Channel 12's mobile unit and we used one of the FM stations. There was a stereo FM station. And, and we used that for the audio. And, and the show turned out very, very good. And it was all ASU talent. Uh, but in stereo, Bob. <laughs> I was uh, drafted for a fraternity. Um, twice. Once was uh, uh, Phi Sigma Kappa. A voice, a voice I worked for at the radio network said, Charles, don't take it personally. We need your grades. <laughs> and, and I went to a couple of pledge affairs there where, where they ex explained uh, you know, first there's a secret right. You'll have to memorize all of it. <laughs> and it's, there's only one ritual. It's the Dean Malay ritual all over again. You know, if you stand over here, you're the sun. And if you're over here, you're a triangle. Mm -hmm. And that you'll only associate with people in this fraternity. And, you know, you'll give up this radio stuff because we have gardens for you to dig, car wa washes, you know, you're to wash people's cars. And so I said, well, that, that's that. Here, Mr. Dodds, take your pen. I'm out of here. Then another fraternity came to me, Bruce Ballard, guy from Chicago. Charles, we need your grades. Or we'll be toast, we'll be gone, we'll be put on probation. And if you're on probation, you can't hold drunken parties, which is what attracts people to these things anyway. And we had a house off campus, a two-story, two-story house, built in the late 20s. And it was on, um, uh, God, not normal. It was way off campus. What fraternity was it? Sigma Pi. I mean, this would be in the middle of campus today, but not at the time. Anyway, there had been an outbreak of venereal diseases, and there was a joke that it had traveled on towels at Sigma Pi. And, uh, it, you know, I had to not have much interest in this, and the people who were really interested were ready to leave. And then we had some people who were there because their checks were good or some, something. Everything was a very pragmatic time. So we had worked out a thing with the national chapter where we would close. We would go out of business uh, at, on this campus and uh, knock on the door one afternoon and, boy, oh, Charles. I'm not surprised. I knew I'd find you in here. She didn't say that. She acted like she's. This is Gamage. Uh, and she said, "Well, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is several blocks away from ASU today, ASC, Arizona State today. You know, but we have to think boldly and about the future." And I think the campus is going to come in this way. Of course. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's out there under the name of her real estate company buying up parts of, of Tempe. And we, we sold her our, our, our house. And she had the house actually move someplace else. And I think it's gone now because the house is in pretty good uh, condition uh, as an old Tempe treasure. And then she held it until the university could afford to 
uh, buy them from her. And uh, I really don't think there's anything nefarious in it at all. It was, she's out there dreaming of a bigger ASU and, and you, have, you have to collect the property before you uh, can plan new boundaries and new buildings and so forth. But yes, yeah, she was, and paid a fair price. I don't remember what it was now, but um, I don't believe she didn't know I was there when she showed up. I said, no. How about the most embarrassing moment? You were part of it. I was never embarrassed. I was. We were in the engineering center, which still stands today across from the bookstore. And we had big windows, just huge, beautiful windows. And unlike everyone else at ASU, I, had, I didn't sleep. I had four or five jobs. I was a disc jockey who was paid in rating performance in cash out of a bag. Here, $500 a point. Yeah. Of course, you went down, out. Um, I had another show uh, uh, with Dick Gilbert in Scottsdale where they didn't pay you in money. They paid you in things. Tires, grease jobs, movie tickets. I mean, it was a trade-only thing. And then I had the job at uh, the Bureau of Broadcasting. And, and so I just had more discretionary money than most people rattling around that building. And I, I'd been going through a car a year, couldn't quite decide what I liked. And then Ford came out with the Skyliner, the 1959 Skyliner, and I bought one from Reed Mullen. It was coral and white. It was the metal convertible where the metal top goes up, the back of it opens, the top of the car goes into the trunk and closes. Can't wait to show it off to you and everyone else. So I park it across the street from Channel 8, and then I go in and I open the curtain. See my car? The motor was on fire. <laughs> the, the beautiful white top covering the engine, had a black circle which was spreading. It was a four-barrel carburetor. And, and it burned up right there in front of all of these friends, all these people I work with. I mean, boy, was I, was I brought down to size, maybe below size. Jeez. I mean, that was just, I mean, I was a victim of my own show. Did I give you a good show? <laughs> How often do you see a car that's minutes old on fire? I mean, it's great. Then, when did you graduate? You know, I wish I had brought my uh, diploma because there are those who don't think I really did. Uh, 1960, and, and it was the first year uh, of Arizona State University diplomas. Unlike today, where people were extremely human, faculty, everyone, they were miserably paid. I mean, the most golden thing you could have here would be some little second contract for the summer. I mean, you were paid for nine months out of the year five, six thousand dollars if you were lucky. I mean, it was, I always thought my advisor, Dr. Bell, was just, you know, a really friendly guy because he and his, you know, he and Ellen lived over at Palm, Palmcroft, whatever, whatever it was called. Yeah. And they'd have a, a potluck once or twice a week and other faculty members would come over what I didn't know until many, many years later was they were all broke. 
they could hardly raise a family on what ASU was paying. So they, the potlucks were a way of stretching their money and, and getting by. Now this is in 57, 58 and things got much bigger, but uh, everyone really knew everyone extremely well. And um, they were, um, I thought they were really a very impressive bunch. I think that um, I was terribly lucky I went to ASU in the, in the first place and the people who make a huge difference in your life are like the, you know, Lois Halliday and Jean Lombardi in, in high school and uh, and then there were people, you know, teachers, professors in college. Um, Dr. Portnoff, who just, no matter how wacky the idea was, she would sit you down. And she had an accent about like Julia Child. Where did this accent come from? And tell you it was really a nice little idea, but it could be a bigger idea. And it didn't have to be mediocre. Now let's work with this and see. And it was like throwing gas in my ear. <laughs> and th these were sto these were ideas for essays and stories. But she was uh, priceless in terms of always being on the encouraging side. She may have maybe she didn't like you or Dr. Bell. I don't know. You know, I'll get him so cranked up he'll do something worse than the sewer. The Gamages were very sweet. Um, Mrs. Gamage once retained me. We weren't close friends. She forgot I was the sewer guy. But if she ha suddenly had to go someplace, you know, they lived right in the middle of campus, she would need a, a babysitter for Gigi. So when she needed a babysitter, she'd just go out to her little white picket fence <laughs> you look good, you'll do, and call you over, and, and you know, here would be Gigi, uh, probably sitting around reading about the land values or water rights or whatever little gamages uh, right at the time, because she was, she was a real estate expert shark. Um, uh, and, and all of those people do kind of shape uh, your life and what happens. And so I always thought ASU was a wonderful laboratory of, of learning and, uh, and I, I enjoyed all of it. I don't know if I would today. It, it's a very different place and it's a very enormous place. So. Uh, it, it's harder to make those uh, connections than, than it was when, when it was, uh, when everything, Arizona is much smaller. Uh, but while ASU was kind of small at the time, its aspirations were over the moon. I mean, the people who uh, were professors there really were committed to it. I mean, they really cared. I mean, that sewer thing. I don't think I ever saw anyone care so much. <laughs> and, <laughs> and while I didn't at all agree with her, I don't want to see her cry, for God's sake. And they gave me the film. They gave me the film after they had it seized. You went to work for two guys that started the station. I was still, I was, I was working for them getting a paycheck before they hired you. I know. <laughs> I know. The hourly wage people didn't count. <laughs> the little people. Uh, and then they hired a professional broadcaster, a professional announcer, who was going to bring professionalism, which obviously people who worked out of sewers <laughs> and borrowed mobile units in the middle of the night were hardly professional. So we hired you to come in and, and, and teach us how real broadcasters 
worked and uh, you were our first general manager and uh, the second well you weren't the founding general manager that was Dick Bell Dick Bell yeah. wonderful guy that we both liked a yeah. lot uh, but he left <laughs> uh, I think it took three times at the legislature before they would grant us permission and the money uh, to go on the air, K-A-E-T. Tell us about the call letters. Kate, we all had great ideas and, and it was settled by the founding general manager, this wonderful guy by the name of Dr. Bell who's the only one with national credits. He had written scripts that had been on General Electric Playhouse. Anyway, he had a logo he'd been working on of, uh, a, of, a, of a school marm, which somebody explained to me was a teacher, a school marm, next to a, a little school out of his Ohio past, I guess. And the name of the school marm and the station would be Kate. And the closer he could get to Kate was K-A-E-T. And, you know, the smart people all knew it had to be Arizona Educational Television, but that was not the intention. It was to be Kate. I don't think she ever got that on the air because Dick left for the University of uh, Colorado, where he hired me in the summers while I was getting my master's at the University of Denver. And then there was another, another fellow that worked with you that came later, later in your career was very important to you, Mr. Loper. Well, he was there um, running the, uh, the Arizona State Radio Network, which had 60 or 70 uh, affiliates. Not that many, probably 40. And they got um, ASU programs from us by tape. And <clears throat> every once in a while there'd be a tight budget. And we were not going to be able to send out another Western Business Roundup because stations really only took our programs to get the tape. <laughs> and they'd erase our program and put commercials and things on it. So who's going to go out there? Not the university lawyer, Charles. We're out of business if we don't get some tape. So uh, I would get my car. I think we were paying 27 cents a mile. I can't. Some, something like that for gas. Um, make sure you're back every night. We're not buying a motel room. <laughs> we don't want to see a state car in front of a motel. <laughs> and there weren't that many state cars. So I, and so I went from station to station and became the station relations guy. And I got the tape back. And um, it, it was valuable. I met a lot of people who later on would be very helpful when Channel 8 went on the air because I would go visit them and then go with them to the local cable company because the cable company's little town, they were, for the most part, owned by people who lived there. So you go to Globe and meet with uh, Willard Shoecraft and he would see that 8 was put on the cable systems he owned, and he, he owned them, I think, all the way down to Safford. So all, all of those things sort of came back and, you know, played into the next, uh, uh, in, into the next step. Then after that, you started directing and producing programs in the, the those early days. Yes. When we had telecourses. We had but telecourses, also, but I think, uh, unless you made this clear in, in your uh, uh, archival uh, portrait, uh, 
I still think the most innovative thing about Channel 8 at the time is when we didn't have anything to put on the air, we went off the, we went off the air. <laughs> Many times we go off the air at 11.30 and then we go to your house and your wife would uh, serve up a wonderful peanut butter sandwich <laughs> and chicken noodle soup. You couldn't beat it. And I mean, those are those those memories have uh, never gone away. And it, you know, if your manners were fairly good, you might end up with some of her cookies. Yeah. She's closed the cookie business, which was. That, was, that went on for quite a few years. Decades, Bob. Yeah. Decades. But then, you tell us about the, those wonderful programs, and I do mean wonderful programs you produced. Uh, I think probably uh, the the uh, the Hoot Hollow was was probably um, uh, something that uh, was very successful, and again. Uh, was not all that different than things I did at Phoenix Union or the Mask of the Yellow Moon or, or all of these other things. I mean, I just keep repeating my childhood over and over and it goes on forever. Um, and so we, we, uh, we were going to put on an evening of live folk music in stereo. And we put it in um, uh, next to the engineering center where there was an inside patio with two cement ledges. And we put cameras up there, cameras you'd never seen before because they were borrowed. And we didn't have the remote unit or it wasn't working if we had one. And so we had long cables. And um, Dolan Ellis was part of a very popular recording group the new Christy Minstrels at the time. And he uh, agreed to be in it and brought a lot of his friends. And uh, a lot of, uh, uh, there were a num number of groups from uh, ASU uh, that sang. And it was absolutely, I would say, in terms of production values, looked as good as anything you would see on any network. What was the most frightening thing about that? The most frightening thing about that. Students it. on the ledges. Well, that was about. <laughs> I wasn't frightened by that. <laughs> I was. Well, you know, you've you have really put up with a lot. Uh, I I do understand why your hair isn't black anymore, and I'll take a a big share of that. Yes, there was always a problem. What are the students doing? You know, you could just look up there and see. The only thing that worried me is whether they would put their girlfriends down long enough to get back uh, to the camera. One of the terrific things about Channel 8, for most of the years I was connected with it, it used students uh, in its productions no matter how big or how important. And that gave them inspiration, it gave them resume material, it later got them jobs. And I think that's something that uh, was not something that, that most public stations did. And uh, it's something I certainly never regretted. Tell us about the cask of the Mariotta. Oh, you didn't really have to bring that up. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I decided I had a future in drama. And I did. It just wasn't going to be at ASU. So we were going to do Edgar Allan Poe's Cask of Montiato because it was short. It was in the public domain. You know, Channel 8's favorite budgetary price, zero. And uh, we recruited some people from the drama department, some professors and some others. And the guy who played Montresor, you know, he's the one that gets sealed up. I think it's Montresor that gets sealed, sealed in the wall. Yeah. Well, anyway, he was a drunk. <laughs> and, you know, I thought he had asthma. No. 
he was always drunk. <laughs> God. And we had to have a long tunnel that went to the cave. And in the cave is where, in, in a niche, uh, this guy gets uh, cemented into the wall. So we, we made our cave out of uh, um, paper mache. We had a paper mache, two paper mache walls, which once we got past the first one, the actors were walking down, walking down. Then we grab the first one and run it around and put it up here so that the tunnel would keep going. And the graphic artist by the name of uh, Michael Brenovich misspelled the credits. <laughs> I don't know if anyone liked the program, but I sure heard about misspell credits for years. And years, and I think it really made me. It, it developed a tick. I mean, later on, I'm in Hollywood, and we're about to produce Steam Bath, and I won't let them start until I've seen the credits and sat there with a dictionary and going through every line. And that was just the recurring nightmares from the, the cats of Amontillado. Uh, I did not know Ladmo well. He he gave me uh, lessons on how to run a Dumont camera in 1959 at uh, KPHO when it was our only station, and it was located um, 921 North First Avenue. Yeah, you know, it's in the Westward Ho property because the owner of the Westward Ho was one of the owners of Channel Five. Uh, John Mills. Um, funny guy, gregarious, really very, very friendly, and was uh, uh, a terrific cameraman. Uh, and uh, Wallace, really creative guy. He was the station art director. He was a fine artist. And uh, so, you know, if somebody needed a rainbow bread slide or something, he would draw the loaf of bread and uh, create the slides and stuff for the, uh, for the commercial. Uh, and I, I like them both, but uh, I can't really say I knew uh, Wallace. He, he, he is one of the uh, most uh, very uh, inward uh, turn guys. Uh, he's, I'm not sure anyone knows uh, him very well except maybe immediate family members and maybe Pat McMahon and, and certainly Wallace. But he's one of the shyest people I've ever ever met in my life. And he would go on and be this character. And, and you would think, oh boy, this guy would be the life of any party. But the minute the on-air lights were off, he would go back into this, this uh, very talented, but uh, very... Uh... And then Bob can bring you up to date on famous majors, what it was like getting a degree for Al Michaels, who will be involved in the Super Bowl this weekend. Without the, Al Michaels might not have ever gotten a television job, it hadn't been for Bob Ellis. I gave him a B in radio television announcer. I kept him from getting kicked out of school because he didn't show up for finals. I went to see Alfred Thomas Jr. And told him the reason that Al could not attend his exams uh, was that uh, they were midterms, was that uh, the World Series was on. 
and that Al's whole life who turned around becoming a sportscaster someday. And, uh, and of course, there was no videotape. There was no home tape. There, there was no VHS or DVR. So Al would sit in his apartment staring at the game with the sound off, pretending that he is doing the play-by-play -play on the World Series. He was just not available for other engagements including going to class at that time. And Al said, so do you think he's going to amount to anything? I said, yeah, I think he is. He wants it so bad, he puts the work in it with no encouragement. His, his family wants him to go into producing game shows, and they own a number of them. But no, I think he's going to be very good. It's just his voice is terrible. He has a raspy voice. And at that time, all of the voices on the air were big, well, like, like Bob's voice, professional. And he said, well, have, I, have you looked at my slides? I'm a historian of ASU. OK. No, I'd love to see them. You're talking about Al Thomas. Yeah. Three or four hundred slides later. <laughs> Al's fine. Al is, is uh, going to go forward. We've waived his midterms. And uh, Al was never sorry, and neither was I. Uh, and he's one of the highest paid play-by-play -play guys out there. And we'll say to this day that uh, he would have fallen off into something else and not achieved his dream